Well, welcome. I'm uh, Peter Shergold, and I'm the Chancellor of the University of Western Sydney, and I welcome you on behalf of the Most university, within which sits proudly the Whitlam Institute, led by the redoubtable and energetic Eric Sidoti, who you'll hear from later this evening. I want to begin by acknowledging the Darek people. The Darek people have lived on the plains and on the riverbanks of this area, we know, for at least 30,000 years. And I do want to acknowledge the significance of that occupation by Australia's first people and recognise their leaders, past and present. Now, tonight, I promise, is going to be one of the most interesting discussions in the lead-up to the federal election, <laughs> because it's going to go not to the rather well-worn and wearisome cut and thrust of specific policies and how they're going to be funded and implemented. Rather, the point of this evening is to focus on the ideas, on the philosophies that fashioned our contemporary parties. And I guess implicit in tonight's discussion is the question, are those ideas, are those philosophical underpinnings still relevant? Are they still relevant to those who join or support political parties more generally? Are they still relevant to the political discourse of 2013? So, first, in keeping with ABC TV's breakfast programme, a statement of personal persuasion. I have not been, and I'm sorry, nor will I ever be, a member of any of the three parties represented here tonight. You're a national. As I confessed. <laughs> yeah. he, he, he's a con. <laughs> well, as I confessed, senators, before Senate estimate scrutiny on one memorable occasion, I was briefly, at age 17, a member of Portsmouth Young Anarchists. <laughs> but being good anarchists, we didn't keep any membership records. <laughs> Shortly after that, in the mid-1960s, I, like so many at UWS, was first in family, in fact, only in family, to go to university, studied American studies, political studies. And I can remember still, far better than I can remember what I did yesterday, two of the texts that I studied. One was Leslie Fiedler, Waiting for the End, which had been brought out in 1964. And the other, of course, was Daniel Bell, End of Ideology, written in 1962. Now, Fiedler suggested that the novel, as a form of literary creativity, would soon disappear. So I'm delighted to say, in my other hat, as the deputy chair of the Sydney Writers' Festival, I can now report, rather thankfully, that uh, if the novel is dying, it's doing so in a very protracted way. <laughs> Daniel Bell proposed in a collection of essays that political ideas were exhausted, that the older, grand, humanistic ideologies were being replaced by more parochial, technocratic concerns of a post-industrial society. And that proposition, of course, was given a new life, as many of you know, by Francis uh, Fukuyama in the late 1980s, early 1990s, with his book, The End of History. He suggested that the universalization of Western liberal democracy was the final form of human government for societies that had become increasingly post-political. So such analyses, and of course they are strongly contested, provides the intellectual context for a more general sentiment that I think prevails now in many of our Western parliamentary democracies, that the key debate is no longer around political ideas. The debate tends to be about who can manage economic and social challenges most efficiently and effectively. And that, I suppose, is the implicit question that underlies the discussion tonight. What are the ideas that sustain Australia's political parties and are they actually relevant to contemporary political debate? 
So here's the format for this evening. Our three speakers are each going to speak for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then after that I'm going to open the floor for discussion. And the first speaker to welcome us to his party is Senator the Honourable John Faulkner. Senator Faulkner was a Labour Party member in the Australian Senate from 1989, of course, representing New South Wales. Uh, he's been a minister in both the governments of uh, Keating and Rudd. He's been the national president of the ALP. He's written a history of the Labour Party. And I say carefully of someone who is actually younger than I am, I see him as an elder statesman of the party. And he is also, I'm delighted to say, uh, the chair of the Whitlam Institute Board. Please welcome Senator the Honourable John Paul. Well, let me also acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Also, of course, acknowledge the uh, Chancellor of UWS, who, uh, Professor Shergold, who I certainly can confirm is not an anarchist, and, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, both my uh, distinguished uh, colleagues uh, on this uh, panel. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the search for Australian Labor's philosophical roots uh, is a bit like the search for the source of the Amazon. Many have set out in hope only to get lost in the jungles of differing ideologies and competing historical narratives. Uh, some try to salvage their pride by declaring uh, these roots never really existed in the first place. I'm sure that some of Labor's uh, modern critics would be surprised to find that they're in agreement with Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, who was, in 1913, dismayed by Labor's lack of interest in destroying capitalism and Labor's bourgeois attention to education, taxation reform and workplace safety. In 1923, Veer Gordon Child, one of Australian politics' first apparatchiks, uh, announced the landscape so changed by parliamentary democracy and the complexities of government and uh, the internal tensions of a mass movement that uh, the source of Labor's inspiration was no longer relevant. Uh, even those hardy few who successfully hacked their way through 122 years of debate, only find themselves among many claimants pointing to their theory uh, as the true ideological origins of Australian Labor. This union, or that strike, or this historical moment, all equally plausible, all equally valid, depending on exactly how origins are defined and how ideology is measured. And of course, uh, all fraught, all equally fraught, uh, in the political struggles within and without the party. Uh, to claim to define Labor's philosophical roots is to claim to define the authentic Labor Party tradition, a tradition against which uh, opponents can be measured and, unsurprisingly, found wanting. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, perhaps uh, Labor's origins are in meetings of shearers and wharfies, making branch members uh, just tag-alongs and bourgeois blowings, an accusation that appears for the first but not the last time in the records of my own local ALP branch, the Glebe branch of the ALP, in the 1890s. Or perhaps Labor's foundations are in the first formal meeting of the Federal Australian Labor Party in the temporary Parliament House in Melbourne in 1901. Uh, perhaps Labor's true beginnings are parliamentary, an argument that uh, has 
had a certain amount of airing uh, in 12 decades of disputes between caucus and Labor conferences. Or perhaps the Labor Party can be said to begin uh, at um, those first meetings of electoral leagues at, or branches as part of a formal party structure, uh, be they in Balmain or Barcaldum. The truth, of course, is infinitely more complex than any one identifiable event or meeting or ideological strand can accommodate. Ladies and gentlemen, Labor was not the creation of a few moved by identical theories. Labor was the outpouring of a common cause, the expression of a shared hope that life could be made a bit better by all of us, for all of us. And Australian Labor sprang up around the country really the way wildflowers uh, spring out of the ground after winter rain. Suddenly, spontaneously and in spectacular variety. Our thousands upon thousands of founders shared a value, not a political theory. They shared a belief in fairness. A fair day's pay for a fair day's work. A fair go for those who couldn't work. A fair trial for those before the courts. A fair shake for everyone, no matter of their background. A fair say in how their government was run. And they shared a belief that it was through collective effort and collective effort alone that fairness could be achieved. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, these men and women were not ignorant of ideologies and theories. Men, many of these were, men and women were ferociously well read, like Labor's first Prime Minister, Chris Watson, who saved to buy books from the wages he earned shoveling manure at uh, Sydney Government House stables. In an age when uh, high school education, let alone a university degree, was beyond the reach of working men and women. Andy Dawson, the Queensland Premier, went down the mines at 13, the same age that John Curtin left school. School of Arts, mechanics and literary institutes, union lending libraries, workers' educational associations, all provided opportunities for self-education. Tens and tens of thousands of working Australians took full and passionate advantage. Their breadth of knowledge of economics, political theory, literature and history is on full display in the speeches and letters that have survived. Unlike those who uh, come to political conviction through philosophical conversion, the men and women who began the Australian Labor Party were searching for the solution to a political problem they had already identified. Too few Australians controlled too much of our country's power and wealth. Too many were too disadvantaged. The solution was to harness the legislative power of Parliament to, as George Black said, make and unmake social conditions. So that, as John Curtin said, a better and more decent way of life can be given to all. They are great aims, inspired by great values. But I want to acknowledge tonight that the recent history of the Australian Labor Party in New South Wales, a party which I have supported my entire adult life, shows for too long Labor accepted in our ranks parliamentary and party representatives who did not share our values or seek to advance our aims. There are no better, perhaps I should say no worse, examples than Ian MacDonald and Eddie O'Bead. 
It may be, ladies and gentlemen, a small minority, in a very big majority of decent, hard-working people. But this does not diminish the gravity of their failure to fulfil their responsibility to represent the interests and values of the labour movement, let alone their responsibilities to the people of New South Wales. Ladies and gentlemen, for over two centuries, working Australians have carried the country forward in their working lives and in their political engagement. It is from the labour movement that so many of the fundamentals of the Australian character and of Australian life have come. The fair go, the safety net, a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. They are Australian values, but they entered Australian life from the labour movement. So did the single constant in Australian federal politics since the nation was created, the Australian Labor Party. Ladies and gentlemen, our founders uh, and those who followed them may have been idealistic, but they were never ideologues. They were willing to take any policy, any strategy, any idea that would make Australia better and fairer one achievable step at a time. They understood that while values are constant, circumstances change. They were pragmatic. In the idiom of modern politics, they believed in evidence-based policy. This lack of a single unifying political theory, Marxism or Fabianism or libertarianism or mutualism or even perhaps anti-disestablishmentarianism, has, <laughs> has of course played a part in the not infrequent internal ructions that Labor has seen since nine, uh, in 1891. And the absence of such a unifying theory has been an ill-informed accusation levelled against our party by some of our political opponents since then. But we in Labor know that standing shoulder to shoulder doesn't require marching in step. And ladies and gentlemen, we know while unity is Labor's strength, diversity is Labor's wealth. The very nature of our party as a broad church has always been a testing and proving ground for our ideas and policies. Our greatest politicians were trained and occasionally humbled in branch and league debates, on conference floors, in lounge rooms and backyards. Our branch and union members questioned and they argued. And in those discussions, Sometimes minds were changed and sometimes policies were. As the only political party older than the nation, the only political party that predates federation, both minds and policies, I can assure you, have changed on a fair few occasions. We chart our course through waters unimaginable to those who came before us, having seen the uh, inflexible political ideologies uh, of our past uh, critics fail and fall decade after decade. For 12 decades, each generation of Labor members, activists, politicians, supporters, has needed to come to terms with the same question. Mapping a course through a future unimagined by our party's founders while keeping our party's enduring values as the compass that guides us. Ladies and gentlemen, governments today face very different questions to those which confronted Chris Watson in 1904. And so Labor's answers must be different too. But our answers should still be guided by our shared belief in fairness and our shared commitment to the principle that working people have the right to determine their lives, the right to negotiate their working conditions and the price of their labour from a position of equals, not supplicants. To vote, to stand for election, to speak freely without fear of jail or the sack. For in labour, we know that the right to economic liberty, the freedom 
from fear and want and fear of want is as much a human right as the right to political freedoms and civil liberties. Ladies and gentlemen, what distinguishes us from those who share some of Labor's goals without commitment to Labor's cause is our conviction that economic and industrial rights are as indispensable to a good society as civil and political rights. Working Australians need both freedom from want and freedom to speak to be full and equal citizens. In modern parlance, workers' rights are human rights. Without them, there is no chance that a better and more decent way of life can be given to all. Labor has always understood that individuals' lives can be affected by circumstances outside their control. Labor's always understood that structural inequalities exist in Australian society. Labor has always seen it as government's role to make sure that those circumstances, those inequalities, don't destroy lives. That no talent is wasted, no potential ruined because of the circumstances of birth. That all of us, every one of us, deserves a fair go. But at the same time, as a party dedicated to enacting our principles through legislation, a party determined to harness the power of government in the pursuit of fairness, Labor has always been committed to our Australian democracy. We have never regarded reform as second best to revolution, although our more radical critics through the decades have been scornful of Labor's commitment to consensus, to community support, to goals achievable not only in theory but also in practice. Gough Whitlam, one of Labor's greatest leaders, said that the task of the Labor Party was to serve, to serve and preserve democracy, parliamentary democracy. He went on to say, I do not seek and do not want the leadership of Australia's largest pressure group. Ladies and gentlemen, serving and preserving parliamentary democracy as a party of reform has brought new challenges in today's cynical and increasingly politically polarised age. Labor can take neither the easy road of promising the world, secure in the knowledge there is no danger of being held responsible for delivery from the crossbenches, nor the low road of promising nothing, playing on and playing up cynicism in the electorate about the political process and the possibility of change. We have, by our nature, the far harder task of arguing both for reform and for moderation. But I believe that it is still possible to make and win that argument. Even more, I believe that it is still essential not only for Labor, but for Australia, that we continue to make and win that argument. Ladies and gentlemen, it is through Labor's faith in fairness through democracy, through Labor's reforms, that we have achieved so much that Australians rely on to protect their industrial, their economic and their civil rights. Reform of the laws covering Australians in the workplace and the unions that represent them, to ensure fair pay, bargaining power and decent conditions. Reform of the economy, whether the creation of the Commonwealth Bank at the beginning of the last century to the floating of the dollar at its end. Reform of the electoral system, from extending the franchise to women to one vote, one value, and most recently working to introduce electoral funding reforms. Reforms to education, so every Australian can fulfil their potential regardless of the wealth or otherwise of their family. From Medicare to the NDIS, from the Snowy Mountains Scheme to the NBN, from the introduction of the aged pension to the creation of Australia's modern superannuation landscape, they are all aspects of the same single story. A story that has changed and evolved over 12 decades, but one where the values and the aspirations remain the same. These values have been expressed in different ways and pursued through different policies 
over the long Australian century. Ladies and gentlemen, we are, as our predecessors were, creatures of our ever-changing times. But our commitment to the shared values of the labour movement is unchanging. It is on these values, not on any dogma, that our party is built. These values and the commitment to pursue them together have been and are at the heart of Australian Labor. Thank you, uh, Senator Faulkner. The second speaker to invite us to his party is the Honourable Joe Hockey MP. He's been the Liberal Party member of the House of Representatives since 1996, representing North Sydney. He was a minister during the government of John Howard. He's now the shadow treasurer. He's also given, I know, a number of very thoughtful speeches on the philosophical premises of liberalism. I'm very pleased indeed that Joe Hockey has agreed to participate this evening. Please welcome our second speaker. Thank you uh, very much, Peter, Chancellor, Professor. Uh, to both John and Bob, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to sit beside you. I have a very high respect for these two individuals. We might not agree on many things, but they are both very honourable men, I might say. Uh, and um, so it is an honour for me to be here. And uh, to all of you, thank you so much for coming along. I thought I'd be, uh, begin by being far more provocative than John. Oh dear. Three weeks ago, we saw the passing of one of the most significant British leaders of the 20th century, <laughs> Margaret Thatcher. She, well, she was, she was not a liberal, uh, she was more a conservative, but we are a broad church. And her 11 years as Prime Minister clearly polarised that nation. Even today, supporters and opponents are divided over her legacy. What is not in dispute is that she inherited a country that was rather dysfunctional and turned it into the, one of the strongest economies in Europe. Along the way, she also managed to restore what was the battered self-esteem of the once great Britain. Now, Margaret Thatcher had a political philosophy that was matched with steely determination and an ability to get things done. She was, in many ways, doggedly inflexible. But for some, she was inspirational. For others, she was evil. No leader, no leader is uncontroversial. And no leader is without enemies, either alive or dead. Ultimately, most successful politicians in a liberal democracy are controversial figures. But I have little doubt that most on both sides of politics have good intentions. We all share the same hope for a better Australia, be it Faulkner, Brown, Hockey or anyone else. We do, however, have competing visions and competing plans. I want Australia to be a country that continues to provide opportunities for people, to build a better life for themselves and their families. And our country is a robust democracy. It's governed by the people for the people. It is one of the most successful democracies in the world. I believe the fact that we are a young country with a diverse people and few of the hereditary class or wealth distinctions of more established societies has provided a fertile ground for our community to develop and flourish. But democracy doesn't just happen, it must be safeguarded, it requires eternal vigilance. The scrutiny of a free press is essential to this. That's why the Liberal Party was opposed to the government's clumsy efforts to stifle the media with their proposal for an overarching watchdog. All politicians have at times felt the sting of media disapproval. Let me tell you, I've caught the blowtorch to the belly, and the belly has been the focus of many cartoons <laughs> campaigns over the years. So I'm no exception. And uh, when you look at a cartoon or you see a headline, you get angry. Uh, and your family gets angry as well. 
But the solution is not to muzzle the freedom of the press. The solution is to battle on, to lift your game, explain your actions. Australia is also a meritocracy. In Australia, your success is a function of your own efforts. How hard you study, how hard you work, how many hours you put in to running your business. In Australia, success is much less a function of your class or your breeding. And I say thank God for that. Uh, as someone who is the son of a migrant to Australia, a refugee, not that he really particularly likes being told that, I'm reminded of it, because he's got fairly strong views about boats at the moment, I must say, but, uh, but I'm the son of a refugee that came to this country with nothing. And there are many, many, many stories just like that. Uh, isn't it fantastic that you could be in a position where one day your daughter or your son uh, could one day be involved in the leadership of the nation that you migrate to. That's the beauty of modern Australia. Uh, it's not to say that who you are or who you know doesn't matter at all. That would be a rather ignorant, ignorant approach and naive approach to life. That's why in the Liberal Party we have a strong focus on a quality of opportunity rather than a quality of outcome. Everyone should have as equal a start in life as possible. Everyone should line up at the starting point with an equal chance of winning the race. Who win the, wins the race will depend on individual talent and effort. Our view is do not slow down the fastest runners. That does not speed up the field. As opposition leader in 1975, Thatcher delivered in New York, I think her finest speech, where she encapsulated this liberal principle before she became a Conservative, when she declared that, and I quote, we must build a society in which each citizen can build, and bear in mind these are different times, his full potential, it should be of course his and her, both for his own benefit and for the benefit of the community as a whole. A society in which originality, skill, energy and thrift are rewarded, in which we encourage rather than restrict the variety and richness of human nature. Opportunity is one of the three cornerstones of modern liberalism, along with liberty and equality. I explored, explored these ideas more fully in my address, uh, which Peter referred to in defence of opportunity in March of 2011. And uh, I said at the time, to deny opportunity to any individual is to deny the essence of their being, and that is an intolerable sin. To th quote Thatcher again from the speech, she said, let our children grow tall and some taller than others if they have ability in them to do so. That is why we believe in a strong education for all children. And I suppose in that sense we're no different to what the Labor Party or what John just said. The quality of education, the level attained, has a strong correlation with success. But that's why we believe in funding support for all children. We don't believe in demonising parents who choose to contribute additional resources to their children's education. If a parent wants to sacrifice income for their children's education, and by doing so, remove some of the burden from the state, they should be encouraged to do so. And they should continue to receive some funding from the government. The Coalition supports strong public funding in the health system. All Australians are entitled to assistance when misfortune strikes. Again, though, we refuse to accept that families who contribute additional resources to their health care in the form of private health insurance should be penalised. In fact, they should be encouraged. The government's persistence attacks on self-reliance through the winding back of the private health insurance rebate is, in our view, counterproductive. It will decrease the flow of private money into the health system and increase the pressure and call on public resources. We also believe in a strong social safety system. But I don't believe in a social safety net. The word net implies some people can choose to live their lives in the embrace of the government for all their needs. It implies that they can be content, that they are being supported by the blood and sweat of others. And I don't think most people would be like that. Where the discretionary receipt of welfare is in place, I don't believe it's good for the individual or society. And I spoke about this in London not too long ago in a speech about the end of the age of entitlement. What I suggest we need is a social safety trampoline, if you like, 
which assists members of the community who fall on hard times uh, with temporary support and provides them with the incentive and the opportunity to get back on their own two feet and find independence. We should ensure support is only provided to those that need it and when they need it. And I fully recognise that we should do more, but we should do more for those that really do need it rather than more for the masses. What we need to build a stronger Australia is to rekindle a culture of self-reliance and personal accountability that makes the welfare system more sustainable for those most in need as our population ages and the pressure on our health system increases. And this reflects our view about government. Our view is that government is based on a number of principles, including but not exclusively the following. First, governments should enhance opportunity with, without constraining outcomes. Secondly, government should live within its means. Third, government should have respect for taxpayers. And that is why we believe in smaller government and greater personal responsibility. If government is smaller, then the private sector, the community, which directly controls their destiny, is larger. So big government doesn't help. Small government empowers individuals and empowers families. That's why we believe in balancing the budget. That's why we believe in lower taxes. And the clash of ideas will be the centre of the upcoming election. In recent years, I want to touch on two other issues. And again, this is a bit different to what John talked about. But I, uh, the philosophy of the Liberal Party, which has been around since 1944, and was based on the energy not just of Robert Menzies and a number of fellow believers, but few people remember that it was uh, based on the effort and support of the Australian Women's National League, which was set up in 1904, uh, which was described as one of the most formidable women's organisations in the world. And uh, as I pointed out at a, uh, in a speech yesterday, uh, the Liberal Party, of course, doesn't believe in quotas, uh, but uh, the Australian Women's National League were formidable negotiators with Robert Menzies. So every branch of the Liberal Party has a women's vice president and the Women's Council is the most formidable and influential part of the Liberal Party. But of course we don't believe in quotas, apparently. Uh, but uh, I'd just say that, uh, and that has had a profound influence. It's also represented the diversity of our party. Uh, our factions are not entrenched like the Labor Party. So you get a diversity of candidates, uh, people. I mean, who would have thought? Uh, and, it, and it's changed dramatically over the last few years. But who would have thought that you'd have Catholics leading the Liberal Party? Uh, 30 years ago, it was, it was inconceivable. And when I was first elected to Parliament in 1996, John Howard talked about the diversity of his front bench because he had Catholics like John Joseph Fay and Joseph Benedict Hockey and that represented the diversity in 1996. <laughs> Today we've got you know, a Lebanese candidate, Martin Zader, here in Parramatta. And at the next election, if all our candidates are elected, the most common surname in the Liberal Party room will be Nguyen. Will be Nguyen. Not Smith or Jones or some of the more traditional Anglo-Saxon names. Uh, and so there is a, a massive change in our party and in the culture of our party, and the diversity is very real. Having the youngest member of parliament, uh, White Roy, elected in a marginal seat at 19 years of age, I mean, is amazing. But he did it on merit. He was the first of his family ever to finish school. His family could never afford to put anyone through to the end of their school years. And to have his celebration of his 21st birthday uh, in our party room, not too, not too recently. And, and to have him as one of the candidates for Cleo Bachelor of the Year <laughs> and be a Member of Parliament was quite remarkable all from the same time. So it reflects the change in politics and at the same time having someone like Philip Ruddock who's been there since uh, Menzies was born. And uh, <laughs> it is a diverse party with a diverse interest and that's represented in our candidates. But it also represents the challenge of modern politics. And I just want to touch on these two points which I think add to the debate tonight. And I think there have been fundamental changes, two significant fundamental changes, 
in the time that I've been in politics, federal politics, in 16 years. The first is the rise of new technologies. It seems everyone has a mobile phone now, which is a recording device and a camera, and which is tapped into a global network. Uh, there has been the associated rise of social media and the Twitterverse, and these developments have led to the increasing dominance of the 24-hour news cycle. Politicians are always under scrutiny and they are always on display, even at times that previously they might have considered private. And they must always be on guard and they can no longer afford a relaxed moment or an offhand quip. Nothing ever anywhere is off the record. Just ask Mitt Romney uh, in the US presidential <laughs> campaign. It wasn't someone in the audience that recorded that famous line that 46%, uh, I think he said, of Americans were never going to vote for him. It was one of the waiters that held his phone in his hand and filmed Mitt Romney saying that and then put it on, uh, gave it to his opponents who put it on social media. So in this environment of constant surveillance, a politician needs a strong set of principles to guide their words and their deeds. Consistent principles, that's essential. And values become more important than ever. And that's why I've talked a little bit about our values today. The second change recognises that the community is no longer differentiating between state and federal parliamentary parties when they're from the same church. It was not that long ago that community would recognise differences between state Labor and federal Labor or state Liberals and federal Liberals. Uh, but now, it's no longer the case. Uh, and it's one of the anxieties that I have that I expressed to John a little bit earlier about the Liberal Party being so invo involved in local government. It's not an area I've ever been comfortable about. Uh, but uh, because the brand and the reputation of the brand, the values of the brand, must be consistent across the whole country. Because we are no longer a whole lot of different fiefdoms as a nation. We are very much a single enterprise. So it follows a trend in Australian politics that moves us from a true federation to a more centralised public sector model, where different levels of government compete to fund or defund previously exclusive areas of responsibility. And this is partly because the federal government is progressively more involved in issues that probably should be the responsibility of the states. And we, we're living and breathing it at the moment with the debate about disability care, which was always traditionally the responsibility of the states or education, which was uh, school education, traditionally the area of the states. The lines of responsibility between governments are now blurred. Beyond that, the behaviour and competence of parties at one level of government impacts on the reputation of all members of those parties at all levels of government. There is less distinction between state and federal brands, and the brand is merged into the single national entity. And I, can, I believe we can see that clearly in what John Faulkner referred to in relation to ICAC and uh, Eddie O'Bead and Ian MacDonald. Uh, what stunned me was how it affected the Labor brand throughout Australia and Queensland and Victoria as well. And the fact that it is affecting the Federal Party. And uh, uh, I'm not going to say there but for the grace of God, go us, but I do say it is a stark reminder for all that uh, no individual can be bigger than the brand. And in modern politics, there is a temptation that individuals, in what seems to be never-ending presidential campaigns, that individuals are far bigger than the parties that they seek to represent, which means <sighs> others in the parties have a responsibility to get back to values and principles and, uh, and in a sense, play down the leadership of any particular individual. Finally, I'd just talk a little bit about trust. In a world where there are now so many different offers, so many different mediums, ultimately brand quality survives. Now that's whether it's in retail, or be it in consumer goods, or be it in services provided by individuals. Uh, the bottom line is people are more likely in a world that is offering far greater choice to go with someone or a brand they trust. And trust is hard to gain, but it's easy to lose. 
It's a central part to the compact a government makes with the people to govern well. A government often wins office on the strength of its promises and the people expect those promises to be delivered. People expect a government will always act in their best interests and will be truthful in doing uh, what it says and saying what it does. So I expect that this is changing the nature of politics, not just in Australia but around the world. At the end of the day, people will reward politicians that have the courage to speak honestly, even to their perceived own disadvantage. And that means that the values you hold and the principles that are consistent with your party philosophy will become even more important than they were when we had the great battles of the philosophies from the late 1800s onwards. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Joe Hockey. And now, the third speaker, who probably more than either of the other two, I can say, is going to welcome us to his party, is, of course, Bob Brown, the former parliamentary leader of the Australian Greens, indeed, the first parliamentary leader of the Greens from 2005, who served in the Australian Senate from 1996 to 2012, representing Tasmania. Bob Brown, of course, was the environmentalist who, in 1972, became a member of the newly formed United Tasmania Group, which is generally seen, I think, as Australia's first Green Party, and then, of course, was the director of the Tasmanian Wilderness Society. I think, without contradiction, he can be introduced as the guiding light of the Australian Greens. Please welcome Bob Brown. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Peter. I'd like to thank the Whitlam Institute, pay tribute to Gough Whitlam and, and indeed Margaret, great Australians, and uh, to thank the University of Western Sydney for hosting this uh, great opportunity to talk about our uh, three biggest political groupings in Australia in 2013. Uh, I might just say at the outset that uh, if I could put down some differences uh, with the Labor and the coalition parties that the Greens hold at the moment, I was speaking with Kate Fearman, who's the Upper House Greens member in the New South Wales Parliament today. She's also the Senate candidate for the forthcoming election in New South Wales for the Greens. Tomorrow she's introducing legislation for euthanasia into the New South Wales Parliament. That's something that Labor and the Liberals won't be doing. And it's a real test to see whether they will support it, because 80% of Australians, and that includes New South Wales people, uh, do, uh, but a minority, a very vocal and vociferous minority, beats the big parties back on each occasion, and uh, the, uh, this great reform is lagging in Australia, as is equal marriage. Uh, the Greens have legislated for that in the Australian Parliament, but we have uh, two political leaders at the moment, uh, the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition, opposed to it. Otherwise, I believe we would have beaten New Zealand to this inevitable reform, which is so strongly and has for so long now been advocated by the Greens. And the third one is the children and other people now locked up on Manus Island and Nauru, something the Greens have fought against all the way down the line, supported by the bigger parties. This cruelty, which I, I maintain, is not only against international law, it strikes at the very fairness that we've heard uh, the two previous speakers talk about so much tonight. The fairness, uh, which is exemplified by the fact that a poll of Australians showed that when asked, would you, if you were seeking, if you were fleeing with your family from a war or from imminent danger, pay someone to help you get yourself and your family to safety, 92% of Australians said yes, because that's how human beings respond to a threat to themselves and their families, and yet we deny them the right to establish that here on Australian soil, except for the Greens. The other thing that uh, I want to introduce to uh, tonight because it's so central to the Greens and to it's the fundamental driving force for the Greens is the word biosphere. 
we are, ladies and gentlemen, all large mammals which come from uh, uh, the biosphere of this planet, which so far as we know is the only uh, place of intelligence and self-reflection built upon life in the whole of the universe. Now, there's hundreds of billions of other potential planets, but we haven't yet uh, found one uh, where it, which has life like this Earth. And uh, it is a fragile thing, and yet, uh, at the moment, is threatened by the behaviour of this consumerist society. And uh, when Peter, in introducing tonight, indicated that there's an expectation that uh, economic management is the hallmark of uh, deci decisions in many people's minds these days about who's the best political operator, who's going to manage the economy the best. Well, economy comes across, across uh, from, uh, comes from the Greek words, uh, which is um, uh, managing your household. But ecology comes from the Greek words, which says understanding your household. And if you don't understand it, you won't manage it. And uh, ecological wisdom is the fundamental difference for the Greens who have grown like that field of flowers that uh, John Faulkner so poignantly described Labor's uh, growing in the, uh, a century or more ago uh, across Australia, like spontaneous combustion. This is something that has uh, seen the Greens grow right around the planet. And when Petra Kelly, the great German Green, came to this great city of Sydney at the end of the 1970s, uh, the firebrand of the German Die Grünen, the Greens Party, as it later became known, uh, she ran into Jack Mundy the, from the Builders Labourers Federation, who was at that time working with people from Hunters Hill to save Kelly's Bush and to save uh, the historic Rocks precinct at Circular Quay against uh, the then driving force uh, of the mega rich and those who can uh, have greatest influence on government to put the bulldozers through both. And the black ban, which had been the word used to protect workers' rights, um, became known through the Builders' Labor's Federation here in Sydney and, and uh, Jack and his cohorts as green bands, protecting the heritage, the human heritage and the natural heritage of uh, communities, of countries, of nations and of the planet. And it, while it may be apocryphal, we simply don't know. Uh, but the story is that Petra Kelly went back to uh, Germany uh, and to Europe. Jack was invited back to a international meeting on great cities in Birmingham. And uh, Petra Kelly, they were, the, we had the People's Party in Britain, we had ecological parties in Europe, all searching for a combining name, and from the name Green Bands here in Sydney, through Petra Kelly, the Grünen became the German party, and the, the terminology, the Greens, became universally applied to this burgeoning, new, ecologically based, but economically wise political movement, the Greens. I left New South Wales and went to Tasmania in 1972, to look at Lake Pedder before it was destroyed by a hydroelectric scheme to produce much less power than an average large wind farm these days does. And in so doing, the Labor and Liberal governments at the time destroyed one of the most uh, gently beautiful places on the planet and uh, at the same time did so illegally because it was a national park and had to uh, after the resignation of the Attorney-General, this was the Reese Labor government, uh, retrospectively undo that illegality to validate through parliamentary numbers the destruction of this international heirloom. And with his foot on a rock in 1971 on the central plateau of Tasmania talking to others, uh, Dr Richard Jones, Dick Jones, said, there is not one voice raised for Lake Petter in the Tasmanian House of Government 
there is only one solution, that we form a new political party. And so they did. And on the 23rd of March 1983, in the Hobart Town Hall, a meeting was held to decide whether or not to proceed with this political option. And uh, at the, uh, with a packed meeting uh, and uh, hydro uh, pro-dam people brought in to the front of the audience to shout it down, the first call for the establishment of this new political party was held down. But Dick insisted on a show of hands and the count clearly showed the majority in favour of it. And that is still marked as the first Greens political part um, party meeting, not just in Australia, but anywhere on the planet. Uh, it came a month before the New Zealand Greens nationally, the Values Party, was established there. And it's interesting that their conversion into the Greens and into parliaments came as a result of the struggle there for proportional representation out of democracy. But I can tell you that wherever the Greens uh, formed around the world and rapidly uh, they set up and were setting up, this is 10 years after Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, informed the planet that we were uh, ourselves a danger to the ecosystem upon which we depended and we should take more time and be more careful and considerate of the web of life on this planet. Uh, we had very rapidly some 80 and now uh, 100 Greens parties around the world. Based on the six pillars of Greens thinking, which are ecological wisdom, social justice, a fair go, that is. And I think while you mustn't slow down the fastest runner, if they've just uh, robbed the uh, public bank, then it's every bit uh, in order to slow down the fastest runner. Uh, participatory democracy, peace, nonviolence, respect for diversity both uh, within our human society, but also in the web of life on this planet, and sustainability, which means making sure we pass on to coming generations of our own species the security of knowing that there is a diversity of life and a sustainable web of life on this planet, in which these days some scientists are predicting uh, well, the United Nations says somewhere between 9 and 10 billion people by the end of this century, in the lifetime of uh, the youngest people in this audience, uh, but other scientists are predicting a population of 1 billion at the end of this century due to the fact that we will have 30% more people, but if current projections on our consumption of the finite resources of this planet keep going, a need for a 300% production of greater resources on a planet where we're already using 120% of the renewable living resources of the planet. An impossible situation. And the Greens have a deep understanding of the requirement for us to use our God-given brains to ensure that we don't allow this runaway consumption of the biosphere upon which we depend to ultimately defraud ourselves, and that means our grandchildren, in an age where Sir Nicholas Stern, uh, the great uh, economist, has estimated that if we don't divert 2% of our wealth now to dealing with climate change, to stopping the tipping point on climate change, our grandchildren will have to divert 6 to 20% of their wealth. And that's a sobering thought. And uh, I have to say that uh, the omens are bad. And that just the repeated uh, attacks on the idea of the polluters paying for the greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere which threaten 6 to 20% of the income of our grandchildren just to uh, absolutely tackle that problem, 
has been uh, the um, matter of great political contention in this country and one in which the negative has gained ascendancy over the positive on the wealthiest planet on, uh, country on the face of the planet. Because according to the United Nations, we per capita are the wealthiest people in the world and according to the OECD, we're the least happy. And I wonder what it is about uh, this policy, uh, this, this politic in Australia in uh, 2013 that has set that situation in train. Because I believe we are a warm-hearted and generous people. We do want, above all, security for those, uh, our children, those who come after us, our children and our grandchildren. And we do want the magnificence of uh, the environment to be made safe by the actions of us uh, taking that responsibility on here in the start of this century so that the calamities that are projected by scientists, I'm not talking about uh, uh, new age theorists or whatever, I'm talking about scientific reality. The Mexican scientist who recently in Australia predicted the Great Barrier Reef due to, due to human interference, not least climate change and acidification, will be a heap of wreck a heap of uh, dead marble or coral by the end of this century. Uh, it, was a, it was a passing um, piece of news that really got no traction. I became uh, entranced by the common sense of the United Tasmania Group to become the Greens in Tasmania, by their agricultural policies, their respect for Aboriginal people, their respect for that human diversity, their concentration on the need for education, and an assured equal education for all people. Uh, and their outreach, their understanding that if we could just divert 10% of military spending on this planet in 2013, every child on this planet could have her belly full, could have clean water, and could have a school she could go to. Uh, by the way, the best prescription possible for winding back runaway population, because we all know that when education comes along, standard of living goes up and population growth is contained. I just want to um, talk about a, a, uh, a couple of pictures because nature uh, must speak for itself uh, if, uh, and must be heard because we are all products of nature if we are going to get the politic of the future right. And I'm, I'm part of a green movement which uh, isn't there uh, as the Democrats were to keep the bastards honest, we're there to replace them. Because the understanding I'm talking about is not there in the big parties. It may be in individuals, but it's not there and it will not be there because economics, growth of wealth out of extracting more resources more quickly is de rigueur to the philosophy of the parties of last century. So if I could have a look at these couple of uh, pictures. I'm this, I just took this picture coming in from uh, Hobart today over the Blue Mountains. You can see Warragamba there in the middle. But it reminds us of uh, the, this World Heritage Area close to Sydney, fought for by environmentalists, and the threats coming down the line as exploiters move to pressure future governments to open national parks, World Heritage Areas, not just to shooting and fishing, but they're every form of economic enterprise uh, you can think of. And it's going to be very important to hear from the big parties about how they'll protect this amenity in the run to September the 14th this year. The next picture shows some of the stems of the tallest flowering plants on earth in Tasmania. Now, um, the News of the last couple of days is that a forest agreement has been reached in Tasmania, uh, but what's not coming through on the ABC, uh, or I think through other news um, organisations too well, is that in the upper house, the Legislative Council of Tasmania, they have gutted the environmental provisions, which meant that 500,000 hectares of Tasmania's forest areas would be protected in legislated protected areas in the main by the end of this year. 
It's now left on the never-never until elections at federal and state level, with the indication that we'll see changes of government. And, th and uh, this leads to a liberal incoming potential which says, and this is the public statements, we will undo every stick of reserve. That's come out of three years of talks between uh, loggers and environmentalists in Tasmania if we get into office. Uh, the next picture shows this rare creature, first drawn here in 19 1797 in Sydney, when there are great flocks between here and Adelaide that wintered on the mainland. And it's the swift parrot, the fastest parrot on earth. It's, it's uh, unique in the fact it's got its own parrot family. There's nothing quite like it. It crosses Bass Strait in three hours. Takes the ferry all night. They cross in three hours. And they go to nest in summer in the uh, coastal woodlands of Tasmania. And those woodlands are under threat. And amongst uh, the potentials coming out of the so-called uh, environmental end of or, or end of uh, dissension in Tasmania is further logging of the swift parrot habitat. And when you've got the trees gone, you've got the nests gone, and as the nests go, so the birds go. Here's the rub. Under this agreement in Tasmania, if I stand with citizens on Bruny Island in front of the 22 hectares lined up for logging of swift parrot habitat in coming months, the Legislative Council has legislated that they can remove the intention to declare 300,000 hectares of forest protected elsewhere. In other words, you exercise your right to peaceful protest in this country and you will be penalised by a greater forest potential environmental destructiveness elsewhere. Just today in Wynyard in Tasmania, the Prime Minister of Australia, Julia Gillard, said uh, in the wake of this agreement, which Christine Milne has uh, been critical of, and I am too, since the Legislative Council removed the environmental component, the logging component stays safe, the hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government will flow, and I instigated those talks that allowed that when I was in the federal parliament. But the Prime Minister said to the signatories to the agreement in Tasmania that they should use whatever means they can to silence those who oppose this agreement. This Putin-esque view that those of us who don't go along with continued destruction of ecological habitats subsidised by the public purse should be silenced is a warning about how, what is going to happen to environmental campaigners in the future. We must stand for this planet because it belongs to our grandchildren we must stand for this nature's heritage because if we can't, this nation's heritage, because if we can't, which other more impoverished country can? And we must understand that our wealth comes not just from digging up the country, but it comes from breathing clean air, drinking pure water, and taking our spirits to be refreshed in the great cathedrals of nature, our national parks, our world heritage areas, and those areas yet to be protected on land and in the oceans. I'm reminded just now, uh, as I was coming here, of the plight of one of the great environmentalists of the age, Paul Watson, founder of Sea Shepherd, currently somewhere out to sea off the East Australian coast, because if he lands anywhere in the world, he will be arrested under a Japanese Interpol alert because he has intervened peaceably on their illegal operations in Antarctica in killing whales. Illegal because the Australian Federal Court 
ruled so. So here we have the upholder of the law, environmentalist, being pursued by the breakers of the law, in this case the whaling corporations of Tokyo, and somebody effectively unable to land, Paul Watson, unable to land because we don't have governments with the guts to say he'll be safe in this country where most people appreciate what he's doing. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's, a, it's a great privilege to be here to talk about this green alternative which this planet, this nation and this city has an option to vote for. Okay, we can now come to questions. Uh, is there a microphone? I'm not sure. Just uh, There is over here. We will come to you. I ask only um, two things of you. The first is to please try and ask a short question rather than make an elaborate commentary. And I'd appreciate it if, as with all our speakers, you focus your questions on the political ideas and philosophies rather than the specific policy initiatives. We're going to hear so much more of that in the next five months. We don't really need to do it tonight. OK, is there a first question out there? Yep, over this side. Thank you. Hi, my name's Phil Bradley, and my question's to uh, Joe Hockey. Uh, Joe, you spoke about the uh, end of the age of entitlement, one of your uh, speeches, and starting uh, the race with equal opportunity. So why don't you and the Liberal Party support uh, an inheritance tax like almost all developed countries in, in the world have? Uh, it isn't um, being born into a multi-millionaire inheritance or even a multi-billionaire inheritance an unfair starting point? And would the Liberal Party and you consider some form of inheritance or wealth tax at a level even greater than some exceedingly obscenely high figure, like $100 million or so. So I'm very interested in your comments because I don't think that's a level playing field when some people start with that wealth inherited right from the start of their race. Uh, well, no. Uh, <laughs> I can think about it a bit more if you want, but the answer's still no. And uh, why? Because we don't think uh, that, uh, you know, and I was just listening to Bob there and, you know, he was talking a lot about fearing what could happen to the globe. And I was thinking, you know, I don't think it's... From my perspective, I don't want to start people off by saying, we want to take what you have. That's not my starting point. I don't see that as, a, 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 as in any way, an act of equality. To say, oh, you've got money, I want some of that. And you might work hard, you might work hard in that, your life, and for a lot of parents, and as a new parent, a relatively new parent, I've, it's really dawned on me. You know, the fact that, you know, I want to give my children a better life, and I worked really hard in my life to do that. And, you know, if I leave them something fantastic, and it could be a farm, or it could be a small business, or it could be the Abdul, the kebab maker in the middle of Parramatta Mall. But why do I have a right to turn around and say, you've got so much of that, give it back to me. I want to take it, I want to give it over here. That's not our angle, and we don't believe in that. Quality of opportunity is about giving people the chance, through the actions of the state, to give them a chance to get ahead. But ultimately, if you're successful, don't penalise people because they are successful. OK, thank you. Yep, it's over here, and I'll try and... Make sure I see everybody. Can we turn the lights up a bit in the audience? I just, yeah, it's, it's, it's really hard to see up, people. Yeah. I, yeah, it's very bright. Uh, um, this is a less, uh, question for Mr Brown. Given that the Greens are clearly the obvious um, logical alternative to the tired old policies of Labour and Liberal, what specific information can you give to the people of Western Sydney especially why they should vote Greens? Well, a good, uh, that, that's a good question. Um, first, first, firstly, 
Uh, what Joe missed to say there, he says equality of opportunity, uh, but uh, it's not equality of opportunity if some people are, are born desperately poor and others are born mega rich. Uh, and nor should we have the state uh, simply move in and, and equal that up. But uh, looking at how you can ensure that everybody's got a fair opportunity to equal education, and that's why we're big supporters of the Gonski um, program, uh, which is partly to be implemented if Labor is returned, but not to be implemented if uh, the opposition gets in. It's not right. If you can go through... It's a Liberal to, government that's signed up, Bob. To, to no a, other government has, including Labor government, by the way. But anyway, it's, it's, to, if, if, uh, well, yes, I, uh, I, I know the Liberal government in New South Wales has, but I'm told that might be very short-lived uh, uh, short if uh, you're elected as in, in government later this year. Joe, is that, you, you can tell me if that's wrong. If, if you, you're wrong. If, uh, if you are saying... Uh, uh, Bob and Joe, I'll just right. explain oh, no, no, the no. rules to both of you. You answer the questions out here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, then, Mr Speaker, you should stop the interjections. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 I, uh, the, uh, the, the Greens have been the driving force for um, universal dental care, and it's now through Labor, through the Gillard government, uh, and they're good officers. It's now extended uh, basically to children in this country. We, uh, we pursued strongly increases in the pension. Uh, the, the national disability scheme, uh, I'm glad to hear, is staying on track. Uh, these, are, it, these are incredibly important for people to have that equal opportunity. But lifestyle is incredibly important too. And the security of people to know that there is going to be clean water available to them, clean air to breathe, and a world that is stable rather than um, facing some of the catastrophic outcomes that scientists are telling us about now is fundamental to peace of mind. And we owe it, that intergenerational equi equity, which the Greens offer, is something that we owe to coming generations. And if you can put a smile on the face of coming generations, look back and say, you stood by us, you can start to smile yourself. Thank you. Do bear with us uh, at the front. We actually can't see the audience, which makes it a bit difficult. So the question down here, and then I'm going to start looking over that side. Uh, Hang on. Just a second. Uh, this is a question for all, I think. Um, is there a concern, or are you concerned about the fact that, uh, um, in, in terms of branch level, um, for parties, there is uh, less and less people actually signing up um, and going to meetings and, and actually having an active um, participation in, in, the, in parties. I, I think we see this in, in all three parties. Uh, do you, what do you see as a solution to that um, going into the, into the future? Interestingly enough, uh, before this uh, formal panel discussion took place, um, Joe, Bob and myself were, and along with Peter, were discussing this uh, very issue. And it's not surprising, I think, that you ask this question. Uh, there's no doubt uh, that the trend that you talk about is real. There's no doubt that the trend that you talk about is not just limited to political parties. But as far as the political party I belong to, it is a real and present problem. I'm very honest about these things. Uh, the Labor Party's membership is not only declining in number, it is ageing. And the party is finding it very, very difficult uh, to attract new members. I do believe that there is a way for Labor uh, to address this, uh, even though it's a, a broader trend that we see in terms of involvement and activism in the community. And I've argued as strongly as I can, and I intend to continue uh, to argue, that the way for the Labor Party uh, to, to deal with this issue is to give uh, Mem the existing members of the party a reason to stay as members of the party and to give those who are considering uh, joining 
um, and supporting Labor's cause a reason to join. Uh, I don't think those reasons exist at the moment. I think they can exist and I would argue the way to address the problem as far as Labor is concerned is to give people a real say in their political party. I mean a real say in the people who represent it in Parliament. I mean a real say in the direction of the party. I mean a real say in the administration of the party and who administers the party and how they administer it and a real say in the policy of the party. If membership can be made meaningful, I believe it will make a difference. I, I agree with that, and I think with um, modern communications, a lot more a canvassing of members of parties' views on, whole, on all the policy suites and on the selection of candidates is, is uh, incredibly important. And uh, it's, there's too little trust by people in politicians and there's too little trust by um, politicians in people. And it, it, I, I think it will move on. One of the things that will happen if it doesn't is we're going to see a much greater diversity of parties and individuals standing for parliaments. I think that's a healthy thing too. Uh, and uh, the sooner we get away from the view that you can only have two parties, one in opposite. Bipartisan, that word is so last century but it's used all the time by the media at the moment. I think diversity, I spoke about it a bit earlier, is in politics is as important as, uh, as it is uh, in society and, and indeed in nature. Yeah. Look, I, I agree with what John said about, um, you know, the parties are ageing and the membership is falling away, although I must say at the moment the Liberal Party hasn't got that problem. Um, and, uh, but it's, it has had that problem over years, um, and, uh, and it will have that problem again in the future. The, you know, the only time, and it comes back to what John said, you need to get something out of it, right? You need to feel as though by joining you, having some influence. And the most, uh, you know, it's not been properly recorded, but the most extraordinary engagement with community that I have seen by a political party was the pre-selection battle between Malcolm Turnbull and Peter King in Wentworth, right? 10% of the seat joined the Liberal Party. And they had to actually be active members. And it's not, you can't just sign up, go to a credit card and give people, you know. They actually have to sign and prove it's their money that is going in. And it wasn't rorted. It was, you know, challenged and checked and challenged. 10% of Wentworth. And it's not a strong Liberal seat. I mean, it was actually, at that time, on the verge of falling to the Labor Party, if you recall. 10% of the seat joined up to engage in that pre-selection, which was a close pre-selection. And it was like a, a plebiscite, and, but on a scale that I've never seen before. And it was really quite a remarkable point of time. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of the, I'd say 70% have stayed in the party, but a lot of them said, you know, OK, well, we did that, what's next? And so you, they're all constantly looking for what they get out of it. I can understand that. And if they don't have to nail their colours to the mast then, and they can still have influence, then that's good too. They won't do it. And social media has given them that opportunity. John, you want to add one thing? Yes, I just want to add one brief thing because just in the interest of a very complete answer, I don't want anyone to suggest I'm not being uh, entirely uh, frank here. I do acknowledge that if you, of course, give people a meaningful say, it means you, put, you take power and influence out of the hands of the very few who currently exercise all mm. that power mm. and the influence in, uh, in the party. That would be the case in the Labor Party and it would be a damn good thing. Yeah. It's the, again, this is a question for all three. Um, I think in Western Sydney one of the big things that's front of mind is jobs, jobs and jobs. And it's... Uh, obviously connected to infrastructure transport. Could you each talk about your vision for jobs, um, not just as, as it relates to Western Sydney, but clearly it's a, it's a front of mind issue for most of us. Thank you. Joe, would you start this time? Look, I, I, I want to be, you, can I talk about infrastructure rather than getting into the, Peter will jump on me if, uh, um, if we get into individual policies. So, let me just point this out. When, when we were in government last time federally, 
I think we didn't invest enough in infrastructure, the federal government. Now, it was traditionally seen as the domain of the states, and you know, I will remember in Cabinet, uh, John Howe and Peter Costello and others would have, would have this debate. They'd say, but that's the role of the states, and that's why I referred to it here. Um, and, of course, at that time, there were state Labor governments, and the state Labor government in New South Wales wasn't seen as, at that time as a very popular government. Um, and what happened was there was just this reluctance to move. But the reality was that when Kevin Rudd came along and said, I'm going to build this infrastructure and that infrastructure, and we said, well, that's not the traditional role of federal government, we lost, right? And why? Because, as I said in my earlier remarks, People have given up caring about who has responsibility. It's all their money and it's all government. Fix it. And they don't care whether you're state, local or federal. If you've got to compete against each other to deliver it, you have to deliver it. And that's a lesson we've learned the hard way in opposition. Uh, we've got to spend money on infrastructure because traditionally 90%, 95% of the money the Commonwealth Government has goes in payments for health and welfare and education and so on. And the feds don't usually build things. Uh, but that has changed. And that's one of the reasons why we recognise, OK, the MBN is being rolled out. We'll have a different approach, but we will roll out, uh, you know, a $30 billion MBN. And we will do it in other areas as well. And I think that's a big sea change over the last few years. Paul? Uh, it's, um, okay. we, we're in a fast-moving world where we can't compete uh, with countries which has, have much lower wages and we have to look at the where we can compete depends absolutely on everybody getting a uh, education without there being cost or other penalties put in the way right through to tertiary education and then ongoing education and beginning much earlier with um, ability to get early age education as well. Uh, we're moving into, uh, and we're moving into a century where uh, ecology is going to be absolutely fundamental. That's why it's really important that the $10 billion scheme coming out of the carbon package, which Labor and the Greens have put through, stays there and isn't dismantled, because uh, renewable energy is part of the spectrum of services which are going to be absolutely critical for, for the future, and it's a potent job creator. It really is. But creativity is the, you know, we, we're in a world where creativity can be the, the, the softest footprint on the planet. And investing much more in arts, in uh, the wider creative uh, spectrum that comes out of any community. It's something that we don't do well in Australia. We, we rarely have done well, but we need to think much more about in the future is giving our, creator, our creative activity to the rest of the planet, and that's a great job creator as well. Yeah. I promised myself uh, tonight I would try and be very disciplined and focus on what uh, the Whitlam Institute wanted us to focus on, being the ideas that fashioned our contemporary parties. But it's an important question that you ask, and I, I just don't want to get bogged down, if you like, in some sort of um, uh, partisan uh, debate uh, about this uh, issue, because I'm sensitive to what um, uh, Peter uh, has said. So, yes, I could, uh, I could of course, uh, mount the case that... Uh, during uh, the global <laughs> financial crisis, uh, the Labor government uh, focused on, on keeping Australians in jobs, uh, the creation of uh, new apprenticeships, uh, the maintenance of economic growth. If I wanted to, <laughs> I could talk about the fact that the government has delivered more jobs and there is lower unemployment in this country. I think it's, uh, I think Joe will correct me if I'm wrong, I'm actually going on memory now, terribly risky business in a, in a panel discussion like this, but I think 5.6% unemployment, mm. which is, which is... 1.6 higher than what you inherited, yeah. Well, just think of, <laughs> if I, I were could, you, I Joe, could say that. let's, no, could let's, say let's, that. let's Let's put it this way, Joe, if you want to get into a no, debate no, no, about no, economic stop, comparisons, stop, which stop, I don't want to, you're, you're in a lot of trouble. Uh, and, and of course, you'd... 
I'm obviously... You'd be, you'd, be, you'd be rightly so also to point out, I think that's less than half of uh, Europe, which is 11.9%. But the serious point I want to raise about this is... Uh, but but looking, looking at the, the broader context of what we're talking about, I mean, I do belong to uh, a political party that I think both Joe and Bob would acknowledge historically through, through the period of his existence has very much had as a cornerstone of its belief the, uh, the protection of jobs, so whether you agree with it or not, whether you support the party or not, protection of jobs, uh, protection of uh, workers' rights and, and, and a commitment uh, to job creation. They are important values to the party and I am actually tonight trying to avoid uh, a, a debate that will end up in some sort of yeah. partisan tennis uh, match which um, uh, we'll both claim that uh, we win. I will, of course, win it and Joe won't, <laughs> but, but we'll both claim I that... I don't think uh, it's between yeah. you and me, John, by the way. No, well, of course, I, I, was going to say, I was going to say, Joe, that I'm a humble backbencher. Half of that's true. I'm a backbencher. <laughs> yes, there's a question over here. Just uh, getting back to these uh, fundamental philosophical and value yeah. issues, uh, and it's been touched on in a couple of earlier questions, uh, I want to put the proposition to the two gentlemen who sit to the left of Mr. Hockey, uh, both philosophically and physically. Uh, the proposition that fairness and opportunity are incompatible, that in fact when we talk about opportunity, uh, we don't think clearly about this. People are not born with the same or equal uh, endowments and people in fact uh, through their experiences of life also are uh, disadvantaged or advantaged and uh, by and large as a general rule people who are more uh, who are brighter or smarter and people who are emotionally more robust do better than people who are uh, disadvantaged in terms of their emotional robustness or their intelligence. Could you comment on this as an underlying principle that has to do with government and so forth? Look, I suppose you raise something that is, uh, I think, uh, a real difference between uh, the uh, Labor and, and non-Labor parties, in this case the uh, the Liberal Party and something that has uh, perhaps been uh, somewhat of a constant um, in, in Australian politics since the uh, formation of the Liberal Party. It's, it is, there, is a, there is a genuine um, philosophical difference here. And I listen to Joe's speech and I listen to Bob's speech and there's much uh, of both those speeches, of course, that, uh, and views that expressed by both my colleagues at the table um, that, um, that, I could, uh, that I can share. But when uh, Joe talks, um, or as a representative of the Liberal Party, and the Liberal Party talks about uh, equality of uh, opportunity, my Labor perspective is that it's um, uh, a, a shallow form of uh, opportunity where not all Australians can access these opportunities in equal fashion. That's my personal uh, view and I think that is, is, uh, is, is typical of the Labor Party. I'm one of those uh, Labor representatives who believes uh, is that, that in, in, I've got a great faith in the the, the services uh, and opportunities that uh, government can deliver to make a real uh, and positive difference uh, to people's lives. Um, and I don't view that as compromise or second best. Uh, and I suppose this is one thing that you've touched on where there's uh, a genuine difference, at least between this Labor representatives and, and some others from um, 
uh, the non-Labor side of politics? Well, I think uh, it's a very important point you make because the uh, things that hold people back are not always obvious. And uh, we in a rich society like Australia have to be all ever mindful of that. And I, I, it's, uh, but we've become a society where it's polarised between those who are mindful of that and those who say, uh, we're going to throw you onto um, making your way in life as if you didn't have any difficulty, if you didn't have any um, drawback that's holding you back in life. And uh, I, I, I just think this uh, emerging neoliberal idea that people um, have a responsibility to look after themselves and that we are all equally able to do that is, is very uh, dangerous and destructive of society. Governments, uh, we are lucky to be in a democracy. Uh, I don't believe uh, that uh, small government is the best thing because small government means big business. And I think uh, those things have to be balanced out. And it is the job of government to help equalise and, and give opportunity to all its citizens. And uh, at the moment we're in a, a, uh, in a time of great wealth where that idea is perhaps languishing more than it has in many, many decades in Australia. And the idea of a fair go that John spoke about is uh, much more fragile now than it has been for a long time. And as a Green, uh, that uh, search for social justice and for equaling things up, and that's why I'm very pleased that we're hearing in this period of government, National Disability Scheme, Gonski Education Reforms, uh, a move towards denty care coming down the line. I think this has been a period of reform in the teeth of enormous criticism of the idea that government is there to ensure there is a net. And I think the net is important because if somebody falls from the trapeze, we don't want them to hit the floor. Now, if there are questions at the back, could you wave your arm around? Yeah, up here, thank you. Hi, so my question is about, um, tonight we've discussed the ideas that um, underlie political parties' philosophies, but often the debate is focused um, on the minute of policy, and it often, you see this disconnect between what parties are supposed to stand for and the policies that are being put forward, both in the way that they're being critiqued, in the way that they're being communicated to the public, and in the way that they're being debated in Parliament as well. How do you reconnect the principle with, I guess, the policy? policy and ensure that people understand both what a party is supposed to stand for and how that fits into the wider scope of, of policy that's being put forward. Thank you. And I think that's clearly a question to all three of you. Bob, would you like to start? Yeah, I would. Well, one of the uh, great difficulties here, um, Joe spoke about the moves to trammel the media. I, I just th saw, thought it's an enormous pity uh, that uh, we don't have a fair media in this country. And. Uh, <laughs> And I don't, I don't see any problem with asking the media to uphold its own self-written code of conduct. Every other profession has to. Why not the media? Uh, because if you're going to get a connect between policy and, and the outcomes, then people have to uh, equally and without the opinionated negativity, which we see so much in the media, and not least the Murdoch media these days, they have to be able to un uh, hear it equally as to what all parties are saying, all, all, all contenders are saying. And that has been taken, not that it was ever there in, I'm sure John reading the early years of the Labor Party will agree that it's always been a big problem. But uh, the, the media uh, has become too much the message and instead of the purveyor of policy to the people so that they could, and, and, and the response back to the uh, politicians. The best thing to get around that is to spend a lot of time in the street talking to people. Uh, and I've, the pity of it is since I've retired from active politics, uh, I've been able to do a lot more of that because it's, uh, it's just so stressful being in there. But uh, we need more connection between our, more fair connection between our people and our politics if that very important principle you're talking about is to, is to return to health. John and then Joe. 
I certainly, like um, every Australian politician, have my criticisms of the uh, media, but I probably don't have as strong as, in, as institutional a criticism as uh, Bob has expressed. I'm going to put more of the blame fairly and squarely on our shoulders, on the shoulders of the politicians, because I actually think the level and strength of advocacy in Australian politics has diminished greatly in recent years. I can assure you the parliament is not as uh, strong a uh, debating uh, chamber as it was when I was uh, first elected, which is quite some time ago now. I think that the, um, I think the parliamentary process um, uh, has uh, and is continuing to diminish. I'm not blaming uh, any side uh, of politics uh, for this at all. But at the end of the day, it is up to us. We have a primary responsibility to be advocates in our own interests and for our own cause. And I don't think politicians are as good as at that as they have been in the past are putting as much effort into that as they have uh, in the past and I don't think for example uh, the best example I can give you is that there are very very few forums like the one that uh, we're having here tonight this is very very much the exception in Australian politics uh, not the rule it's a great thing that the Whitlam Institute uh, has done this. But I think if you had more fora like this, you would probably have um, uh, start to develop a, uh, a, a different uh, perception uh, in the community. We have to work very hard uh, to lift the standards of political debate in this country. It's fair, uh, I think, to lay some of the blame at the door of the media. I think it's also very, very fair to delay, delay uh, a, deal, a good deal of the blame at the feet of the politicians. Well, the world's far more complicated today than it was five years ago and 50 years ago. Uh, town hall meetings uh, are not about simple issues. Uh, you look at the diversity of the commentary today and tonight. Um, Look, blaming the media, I just think that's pretty pathetic, really. I, I, I've, you know, seriously, I mean, we've got more outlets now than we've ever had. We have more outlets now than we've ever had. We've got uh, more... Di <laughs> well, you're entitled to your view, but the, the, the fact is, as someone who actually provides content for the media, uh, I can tell you I spend way too much of my life communicating through the media with the Australian people and getting feedback, whether it be two 24-hour news channels, uh, social media, uh, blogs, uh, email, uh, letters, uh, community forums, uh, radio, one end of the country to the other. Uh, it goes on and on, right? And uh, it's never, never ending. And the communication is different. When Billy McMahon was Prime Minister, he had an average 21 seconds face to camera on the nightly news. That would have been a and break for the Liberal Party. No, no, that, that's why we lost, right? <laughs> that's why we lost, I'd imagine. But um, 20... But Goff would have been the same, John. Maybe that was why he lost. Goff has never limited himself to 21 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> the point I'm making is 21 seconds of Prime Minister's face to camera on the nightly news. Now it's about two seconds, if you're lucky. Two and a half seconds we worked out under John Howard, right? Because the rest of it is interpretation by the journalist. And it's journalists interviewing journalists, as if they're experts, right? So that's just, you've got to try and find a way around with it and deal with it. Um, and, well, and you've got to find a way to get around it. And that's why, you know, for example, I have 70,000 people following me on Twitter and 10,000 on Facebook, and it's a pain to keep communicating, but I keep making the effort. And why? Because I speak directly with those people, and they speak back directly with, to me as well. 
I don't always like what they say, I can tell you. And if you read it, because it's very public, some of it's very brutal and ugly and nasty. But you know what? It's not filtered if I'm on the nightly news. Uh, and therefore, from my perspective, you've just got to find different ways to do it. I agree with John, and I know he is a very good parliamentarian. And uh, I pay tribute to John Faulkner for his work in, in establishing parliamentary budget office, a range of other things. But, and, and I think we should do better with Parliament. I, I totally agree. Uh, but part of the challenge is so much of it is focused on communicating to the broader public, still with the 6pm news bulletin. So Can I ask um, you, Joe? I mean, I, I think one of the things that, one of the problems that we face is more and more uh, politicians are more and more uh, scripted. Uh, and uh, there's so much uh, discipline coming from yeah. uh, leaders' offices and the, the party offices uh, that uh, the, the time for the, you know, the place for an eccentric politician such as yours truly is uh, is uh, Yours truly passed. being which one of us? Moi. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, I would never accuse you of being eccentric. <laughs> no, I, I just hang around with eccentric people. Um, Look, I, I think you're right, but having said that, uh, you know, no one thought that, that morning TV would work, all right? And I didn't like doing Sunrise to begin with, right? I resisted it. It's been to 20,000 people. That's something you haven't got in common with Kevin Rudd. No, that's <laughs> right. But what happens is that, that we started to engage with an audience that we never engaged with as politicians, all right? And that's why Morning TV has been so successful. I do, as a shadow treasurer, I'm expected to do Late Line and Bloomberg and talk about the most technical aspects of the economy. And then I'm expected to go on the project and communicate in what is limited to, uh, they tell me, 30 second answers and three answers only, right? We have to go into the studio, get mic'd up, mic up, and then they give you one and a half minutes to explain some detailed policy, if you're lucky, with their interjections. And you're going, how do you communicate? But it's an entirely different audience. And my 26-year-old niece said, Uncle Joe, I didn't know what you did until I saw you on the project the other night. <laughs> 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 so okay. you've got to reach out. You've got to put the effort in. Over here, please. Yeah. And then I'll come to that one in a sec, OK? Um, Mr Faulkner, I'd like to thank you for um, your answer then, and that, that was my question. Where is the integrity today in politics and that? And it's become something like Sydney Stadium, the House of Stoush. It's disgraceful some days and that in politics. I think the political parties have lost the plot in some cases. They forget that it's the people's house and they fail to show respect to it. And I think your question and answer, the question that was asked, and the answer you gave was very good in the sense that you and the media have let us down too, right, in failing to show us respect in the House. And I'd like to see a better level, a greater level of engagement. No matter who's in power and who's running the show, the opposition is there to enhance the government and the government is there to be there as the government to lead Australia. This cat fighting that's going on and this negativity, it's a shame. It really is a shame. But thank you for being so honest about it. Well, I, I don't want you to misinterpret me because I, I'm, I'm very much in favour of, of the Australian Parliament and parliamentary forums being uh, very robust. I, I, can't, I can't think of anybody who... who who has been more robust in Senate committees yeah. uh, than I have, and I and um, I've given no quarter, and I've asked for no quarter either in the in in the chamber, the Senate chamber, or in uh, Senate committees. But I am making the point that there is, I think, there would be a, a lot more interest in the community of what politicians were saying, even if largely they're giving talking about the same things, but perhaps they could even um, show enough initiative to use different language. There might be more opportunity for our uh, friends uh, in the media to, uh, to, give, um, uh, to give those sorts of comments uh, 
some attention. I think we've really dumbed down politics uh, um, at their level, at that level. But of course, the the, the parliamentary chambers they do have to be uh, robust. Uh, we're 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 talking about the government and alternative government uh, of the nation. These are these are big stakes. Uh, they're incredibly important uh, issues, and we have. Uh, a very strong and robust parliamentary democracy in this country uh, that's reflected well, I think, in, 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 in many senses uh, in uh, the way our parliaments uh, around the nation work. What I am merely saying as far as the politicians themselves are concerned, uh, which is something I think uh, Joe said uh, a little earlier, I'm, I'm interested to see uh, not only uh, the views of the political party I belong to uh, expressed by members of that party, but also uh, other views um, of interest that are contributions to uh, debate and public discourse uh, in this country. The same goes as far as I'm concerned for Greens and members of the Liberal Party as well. That's where I think we can do a hell of a lot better and I hope um, I hope the next generation of parliamentarians will try to do so. Thank you. Yes, the question back there, and um, then we're going to come down here. Thank you very much. My question goes to Joe Hockey. Um, tonight you've spoken quite passionately about equality of opportunity, and I think all of us can, can agree with that general principle. But surely there's a follow-up question there, because and that is equality of opportunity to do what? Because if you look at Liberal Party policy, it seems that you're interested in opportunity to buy a better education, to buy better health care, to buy a better life. Um, what is this opportunity you speak of? To determine your own future and not have someone tell you what it should be. I, that, that is what it is. I mean, let people dream. And, and I just, I, you know, I, uh, I can't stand the regulation in our lives. Every aspect of our life is regulated. From where you put up a sign to, you know, how you drive, where you cross the street, uh, you know, every aspect of life. I mean, seriously, think about so it for a moment. We were looking for people like you in Portsmouth, young anarchists. Yeah, well, that's right. <laughs> I, I know I won't be invited, Joe, but I sure as hell aren't going home in a car with you tonight. <laughs> that's right. I, I, you know, seriously, I, I just, I'm sick of the regulation and the control and it's others telling me how I should live, mm. how I should raise my children, what I should do. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it, you know? And you, you say, what is the equality of opportunity to do what? You tell me because that's my job. It's not my job to tell you what your opportunity should be. It's me to give you the, the starting point, to give you the education, the health care give you every opportunity to make your dreams come true. And that's why under us, when we went into government in 1996, there were 600,000 small businesses in Australia. When we left, there were 2 million small businesses in Australia. Because people were given the opportunity to go ahead, to choose their destiny. And, you know, some don't like that. Some like to have Canberra tell them how to live their lives. I don't. Sorry, I don't. OK, there's a question here. Hi. And then one here, and then I'll take one final one in the middle. Okay? Yeah. Uh, just so you know, Joe, you're my fourth favourite Liberal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm being number one, and Mr. Howard being number two. But you're just talking about um, who's three? <laughs> <laughs> Bromo Bishop. God no. Um, but you're just talking about um, how he's not, he's not you don't like us. government interference in your life at all, and how that's quite frustrating. But uh, you don't seem to share those same views when it comes to people who want to marry who they want to marry. And uh, I just find that a little bit hypocritical and I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit. Mm. As if I've never been asked before. Uh, no, well, well, um, well, I, in I the public forums everywhere. Um, it is my personal view, and it is my personal view, uh, that a marriage should be between a man and a woman. Now, you know... I may well be on the wrong side of history, as I've said before, and people may hoot and whistle at me, but I am asked to explain my own view. And for various reasons, that is my view. Now, uh, if the parliament were to have a free vote, uh, I would vote that way. Uh, I, um, it has been reported that I've argued for a free vote, 
Uh, and uh, uh, I believe the Liberal Party facilitates that more often than any other political party. Oh, every vote's a free vote in the Greens, isn't it? I'm sorry. Every vote's a free vote in the Greens. Um, but uh, it, 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 it is my view, and that, that's the, you know, the ancient institution of marriage is between a man and a woman. Uh, that's it. Sorry? How do I define... Yeah. Um, no, no, I understand you. Oh, look, I, 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 I can only go on the traditional definitions, not that they're all, all encompassing, but I can only go on the traditional definitions of a man. Um, well, uh, I, am, I have always argued for equality in partnership and, you know, that that applied from a civil union perspective. So I always argued internally and externally in the Liberal Party, as have a number of others, that there should be absolutely no discrimination on the basis of civil unions. Uh, but marriage has been uh, defined for thousands of years, arguably. And from my perspective, I have personal views about it. And I can't change those personal views doesn't mean my children won't change their views and may well be, uh, you know, have, have, have an entirely different view to me and they're entirely, and they may well be, I hope they're not, but they may end up legislators and they might be the ones that do it, but I suspect it's not far away. Having said that, the House of Representatives by a two-thirds majority voted that a marriage should be between a man and a woman. Uh, I suspect it'll change, but... Uh, from my personal perspective, it, it won't. Well, it's one, one issue in which uh, Joe shares the same position as Julia Gillard. But, you know, when it comes to regulation, um, he, he says he gets wild about regulation, but expects two million Australians to be happy with a ban on them, their ability to be married. It's just not logical. And it should be changed. Uh, I argued at the Labor Party's national conference unsuccessfully uh, for, or successfully, for marriage equality and unsuccessfully that it shouldn't be subject to a conscience vote. Yes. Yes. Question here. Thank you so much. And thank you for being patient. We focused a lot on the experience of individuals and what happens within Australia, but at the level of principles, is there a difference between the parties now on their views on Australia's place in the world, or role in the world? Thank you. I think that would be a, a good question to uh, end this because it's applicable to all of our uh, panel tonight. John, would you like to start? I don't know whether I can answer uh, your question about the difference between the, uh, the parties uh, uh, on this uh, issue. Um, uh, I can only talk to you from uh, uh, my perspective as you know, a long-standing member of the Labor Party, someone who's served in uh, a Labor cabinet as, uh, as Australian uh, Defence Minister. Um, I think that uh, the party I belong to has always uh, argued for uh, a strong, uh, independent uh, Australian uh, foreign policy. We've always argued that we play our part in the international uh, community. Uh, in the United Nations, uh, of course, um, uh, as uh, the critical player, in our own region and in defence of um, and in support of our uh, long-standing uh, alliance uh, with the US. They're the three cornerstones of Labor's current policy and I think they remain consistent with uh, the long-term uh, position that uh, our party has taken and stand very much in accordance uh, with those, um, those values uh, that uh, I spoke about. If you like, 
uh, the defence of uh, Australia uh, and its uh, uh, independent uh, place in the world is very much a thing worth fighting for. Um, thank you. It's a great question. I think Australia undersells itself greatly and we could have a much greater impact on, on making the world a more secure place. The Greens opposed the Australia's um, subservience to the United States. It's a great friend of ours, but it was in, in entering the Iraq war on what we now know was a lie. And uh, in the much greater um, death toll that's come out of Afghanistan because uh, George Bush diverted to Iraq when, uh, uh, from Afghanistan and, jo and John Howard went with it. We should have been uh, making our independent judgment there and, and should have kept our troops at home. That said, the Greens were the first to call for uh, Australia to have military intervention in East Timor to give the people of East Timor their independence. And a, and a final thing here, I've been a great advocate for global democracy. Uh, I'm not the first, Socrates was at it a long way back. <laughs> but uh, we have to extend democracy on this planet to one person, one vote, one value. And when we went to Iraq to forcefully give that country democracy as against a tyrant, that was the later excuse, I put up a motion in the parliament that there should be a global parliament just to deal with international issues and uh, it was voted down 74 to 2 with only the two Greens supporting it. Uh, we have to see everybody on this planet as equal, one person, one vote, one value, one planet. Well, essentially, uh, uh, there's been a pretty bipartisan approach over the years in, in foreign policy. I mean, I'm not going to suggest otherwise. And I think that stability has helped us rather than hindered us. Um, and I think that when it comes to foreign policy, I think it's hugely important in, in reflecting your place in the world, as you correctly put it. I think it is hugely important that the way you project yourself to the world reflect your values. And the values of mateship and, and honesty, trustworthiness, reliability, predictability, are hugely important and often undervalued. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was, and I'll give you this one little example. I was, Kim Beasley, is, is, he is an outstanding ambassador in Washington, I must say a great ambassador. And I went to Washington a year and a half ago and I was able to help him to get access to some people in the Republican Party he'd never had access to. And similarly, he gave me access to others. And we worked together in the national interest to get that sort of access. But the Deputy Secretary of State, uh, who I'd formed a friendship with, was a strong Democrat. Uh, and uh, Kim knew him reasonably well. And, you know, we gave ourselves, each other a bit of a hug when we saw each other in, in the Department of State. And he said, Joe, have you had a look around the building? And I said, uh, Tom, no, I haven't actually. He said, let's go for a little tour. And, you know, there's Kim, myself, the, you know, three other advisors to the ambassador and his staff. And we're like a conga line going through the kitchens of the Department of State and people are polishing the silverware and... You know, through all these back offices, and he showed me Hillary's office. I said, where's the photo of Bill? Uh, and, you know, all these sorts of things. And I thought to myself, you know, and I'm a, you know, even though I've been in politics a while, a bit of a novice, I thought to myself, how many other countries would have that sort of relationship with the United States? Now, I'm not saying the US is a be-all and end-all, because I've had that sort of relationship in Singapore and Japan, to be honest, uh, and you get it in a number of other countries, some countries a lot more formal. But the fact that they, if they look at you in the eyes and they see that you're honest and you're trustworthy and you say, look, how can we help, mate, when they ask for something, they're the qualities that Australia has and they're our very best qualities. And if we project them onto the world stage, we will get, we will bat way above, way above, our weight. I mean, we're still one and a half percent of the world economy, not much. And we're still, you know, a very small fraction of the world's population. 
but because we are honest and trustworthy people and we're there for them during the tough times and the times that are hard for us. Uh, you know, Bob mentioned East Timor. That was very hard. Australian troops going into our nearest neighbour was not an easy decision. And we had to massage that and we did it. And that was a very, very important thing to do. But equally importantly, in the, ha in the face of Hansenism in Australia, for us to lend billions of dollars during the Asian financial crisis to countries in Asia that were on the threshold of starvation was equally important. And they knew how hard it was for us to do that because of the resentment in Australia. But we did it because it was the right thing to do. And that's what mates do, to use that term, when others are in trouble, you stand by them. You give them everything you can to help them through the dark times. And they remember that. Malaysia remembers it. Korea remembers it. They remember it. Indonesia remembers it. And I think those qualities will project us onto the world stage. It's helped us a lot in the past, and I think we've got to you know, continue to project those Australian values in the future. Well, thank you all very much, and I apologise for those questions that I didn't take. Just two comments. The first is, of course, from my point of view, that I am delighted with the shared view of all our speakers this evening about the value of educational opportunity and where it sits in their parties. I think we're lucky as a nation to have that, although, as a number of you have noted and we've heard, there are nuances around that idea. Of course, I take pride at the University of Western Sydney in the excellence of our teaching and the increasing international recognition of our research and our community engagement. But what really, I think, uh, turns me on, and many of those who work at the university, is that sense of our distinctive mission, which is really all about educational opportunity, of providing a university that is available to all those who can make use and benefit from the higher education that it provides. As I think about the graduations, where we have 70% of our students from Western Sydney, mm. where we have 24% of our students are lower socioeconomic status, the highest in this country, when I think that a third of our domestic students speak a language other than English at home, and that nine of those 10 languages are from the Middle East, the Indian subcontinent, or China, then I think to all our panelists, I can see the future face, mm. the next generation of our political leadership. Mm. And I think that's inspiring. <laughs> the second thing is that I just want to, uh, to thank all of you. When Eric and I talked about uh, this, I think we were both wondering, could this actually work? That you could actually have a discussion about political ideas and values and philosophies. Um, and it has worked. It's worked because of how well our three speakers have stuck to that script, <coughs> both in what they presented and the way they answered questions. But most of all, it's worked because you, the audience, have played by those rules. And I think uh, John Faulkner is right. We've had a discussion which is highly unusual in Australia today. So thank you all for doing that. And now I'd like to ask Eric Sedoti, who is the director of the Whitman Institute to say the final few words. I am a, a part Greek bearing gifts. Ah. <laughs> Put them there just for the moment. To our panellists and to the Chancellor, thank you very much, one and all. Uh, I'm not a historian, uh, but over the years I've come to appreciate that it is difficult to understand Australia without some understanding of the people and the forces that shaped us. Not knowing a little bit, a little about our political history, you can miss a few things in our contemporary politics, including the exquisite ironies and humour. Clive Palmer's recent resuscitation of the United Australia Party is a case in point. <laughs> now, I don't know Clive Palmer at all, which may surprise you. But um, I have thought his public persona at least suggests a man with a pretty well-honed sense of Australian humour. 
whose choice of name for his political party, in contrast to the eerily postmodern Catter Australian Party, yeah. can't help but make you think that it was a bit of a tongue-in-cheek dig, uh, dig at his uh, erstwhile political fellows. However, a quick dig around the original United Australia Party might give us some understanding of the political appeal. Manning Clark, for example, writing of Joe Lyons' 1931 election victory, tells us that Honest Joe Lyons was enjoying one of his freedoms in the United Australia Party. He did not have to go any more cap in hand to any party caucus. Mm. <laughs> the historical irony of Mr Palmer's new UPA lies in the fact that the, UA, sorry, the UAP, uh, when first formed, as its name suggests, was all about the formation of a single united opposition. And these are some of the quirks of history. But things do change and meetings get lost or reinterpreted, and of course, so they should. But there can be little doubt that such changes bred in ignorance of the historical antecedents and influences will be inferior, a house without foundations. For the Whitlam Institute, it all underlines the need to nurture a civil, if robust, exchange of ideas, the sharing of knowledge and experience, an interest in and understanding of our social and political history, a widening engagement in public policy development as well as public policy discourse. It is for all these reasons that gatherings like this evening are so very important. Our motivation in hosting this forum stems from our conviction that it is timely and healthy that citizens be encouraged to think about and debate such matters, informing their own views on what sort of Australia we might want. We have been so very fortunate, as Peter has already suggested, in having John Faulkner, Joe Hockey and Bob Brown as our guest speakers this evening. It's a rare opportunity to have our political leaders and elders share a platform to discuss the bigger picture, the thinking and the history that lie behind the policies and to do so openly with a packed theatre of citizens who come here unscreened and uncoached and who are free to put their questions directly without filtering. When there is so much endless chatter about the so-called crisis of trust in our politicians, this evening gives us good reason to remain hopeful. Uh, in fact, I think it was Bob who mentioned that, uh, the way I've captured you in my words, uh, that trust is a two-way street, and that John Faulkner, Joe Hockey and Bob Brown have shown themselves willing to trust all of us in agreeing to be here this evening. Not one of them hesitated when asked and invited to attend this evening. Not one of them imposed any condition nor was there ever a suggestion or a hint that any condition should be imposed. For myself, this conversation has whetted the appetite for such opportunities, and I would hope that you might agree. Now, this is not to say that there weren't a few moments, it seemed to me, that they struggled to keep to the, uh, to the brief. <laughs> but um, political cultures are shaped and formed, and they happen with practice, and we would hope there will be other occasions for other politicians and other citizens to join and discuss. We are a mature democracy. We can be a better democracy. So I'd ask you once again to thank our three speakers and their contribution for all of us this evening. I have about three million asides on my notes here as so things went through, including I was looking for my house, Bob, and that photo of the Blue Mountains being the Tumberite. And there are a few mountains people here tonight, I noticed, which is a very good thing. Uh, there are a few other people that I would like to thank. Of course, uh, Professor Peter Showgold, Chancellor at the Great University of Western Sydney. Robert Love, uh, who's the director here at the Riverside Theatres, and the whole crew at Riverside who are extraordinarily generous, loyal, and supportive partners uh, in much of what we do at the Whitlam Institute. Our friends from the Museum of Australian Democracy, there are three down from the Australian, uh, Museum of Australian Democracy here this evening. Uh, don't leave this evening if you haven't done so already without looking at the Behind the Lines exhibition, which Moad, ourselves and Riverside co-host the only Sydney showing each year. And of course to our UWS colleagues and as always my own staff at the Whitlam Institute. And as has already been suggested to you, fellow citizens, for your interest and your enthusiasm in being here tonight, please don't rush away. Robert, uh, in a great gesture of hospitality, has provided some drinks, refreshments and food outside, so please do join us for a slightly longer chat. We will see you all next time. Thanks, Matt.